Good evening and welcome to today's program from the Free and Secular Gallery, the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. I'm Ying Ying Chen, public group, public program specialist at the museum. We are here tonight to celebrate Lunar New Year and to explore Lunar New Year food traditions and festivities. So to kick off this conversation, for those who celebrate Lunar New Year, we love to hear how you will celebrate a holiday this year. So if you would like, please feel free to share um, in the chat. Today, we have two special guest, guests join us tonight. Um, we have Jen Stewart, a um, curator of Chinese art at Free and Secular Gallery, and uh, Lydia Chang, culinary entrepreneur, um, whose family also runs uh, Peter John and several other restaurants in Marion and Virginia. Hi, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Lydia. Hi, good to see you, Jen. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Yes. So in today's program, uh, Jen will show us some artwork from the museum's collection that can be linked to Nuna Nure Food Station. And Lydia will jump in to share her personal story and mem memory about the holiday. Um, so uh, to me, uh, Nuna New Year, it's, uh, has a distinct tie to foods. It's a 16 day of celebration filled with peace at homes of family and uh, friends. So I'm wondering, Lydia and Jen, what's your favorite dish for the holiday? And also, is there anything about meaning associated with your favorite dish? Lydia, you go first. Alrighty, well, my favorite dish has to be dumplings. Um, I grew up eating dumplings made by my mom, my grandma. Um, we typically like dumplings this year round, the Northern style, which the classic filling is minced pork and Napa cabbage. Uh, the dumplings are made in the shape of gold ingots, which symbolizes wealth and prosperity. And the process of making dumplings, it's so interactive and fun. It brings all ages in the family together from making the dough to the wrappers and form the shapes. And for me, anything Lydia cooks is gonna be my favorite, but you know, it's a hard choice. I love chicken soup with dumplings that look like ingots and so it's money, but most of all, it's the steamed fish with flavored with ginger and scallions. And I love the one with the black bean sauce, the fermented black bean sauce. But the word for fish is a homophone. And so it sounds like another word that means surplus. So when you have a whole fish head to tail, it's may your whole year be filled with abundance. And I just love that symbolism while I'm getting such good savory flavors. So um, I just want to thank you for what you both just shared. And uh, what you both share really makes me feel hungry. And now I will turn it over to Jen. Well, if you're hungry, maybe these door guardians will uh, scare you back into control of your hunger, your appetite. These are prints that are typically put up at the new year in order to protect a household. They're put on the twin outer doors of a traditional compound. And today they're just put on the walls of houses, but they're protective uh, deities. And the Chinese in between the posters is saying, may you have all great things during year of the ox. And just showing this, um, this idea of prosperity, abundance, protecting from evil. This is what the Chinese New Year is about. It's a time of renewal. It's a time of light from darkness. It's getting ready for the growth of spring. And in fact, Spring Festival is a very common name for the Chinese New Year. So it's a time with lots of jubilant, um, riotously fun activities. And it also is punctuated by a few quiet interludes for honoring the ancestors. But whether you're looking at how you um, pay 
obeisance to the ancestors or how you celebrate with your family, there's always food present. So that's why we chose looking at food. And so I'm going to show two artworks um, that also make references to food. So why don't we go to the next? This just shows you the gallery. Oh, well, um, this is the gallery in the Freer building where the objects we're talking about are on display, except that the building is closed, of course, temporarily, but just to situate it. Now we can use the wonderful features of Zoom to look at our artwork. So what you're seeing here is a painting on silk with ink and color. And it's a fabulously rare painting from the early Ming dynasty, I think most likely early 15th century, that depicts the women's quarters in a palace or a princely household, women and children getting ready to celebrate the new year. And the detail here is a box filled with food and we'll talk about it more, but first I wanna show you the whole painting which encapsulates several key activities. Next please. One of the things that you see in these activities in the princely household and things that are important about Chinese festivals is that actually what you do, the activities are inclusive all the way from the court down to the commoner. They're all the same celebrations in each household. It's just, of course, here, they're on a much more lavish scale being in a princely household. But you see a woman hanging up a print on the wall. And this is a print of a very disheveled figure known as Zhong Kui, and he's the demon queller. So he's going to protect the household. He's gonna kick out evil and make sure that everything goes smoothly during the year. You see another woman holding a red candle. So we know this is New Year's Eve. Next, please. So one of the details that you see in the scroll is a little boy in red covering up his ears in anticipation of what the maid is doing. Uh, she's kneeling on the ground lighting firecrackers. And up above from another painting is a little detail of Chinese firecrackers and they're wrapped in red. And one of them is actually wrapped with a picture of uh, Zhong Kui, the demon queller. So the firecrackers also scare off evil but they have another purpose as well. They can be uh, set off right before the moment of the changing of the year. They can be set off at the family banquet in order to announce to the ancestors that it is time for the family banquet and invite the ancestors to come and eat at the table. Next, please. Every little detail in this painting is charming and yet coded with meaning. Here you see one of the little boys who's maybe so little he's not allowed down near the firecrackers, but he's peering over watching and behind him is a gorgeous cat. And the cat, if you look carefully, has a red bow around his neck. So not only the children, but the cat has to dress up for New Year's because it's very important to wear new clothing for New Year's and red being a lucky auspicious color is usually what they wear. Another little symbol is cats. The uh, word for cat is a homophone for being 80 or 90 years old. And there are lots of references to longevity in this scroll and other New Year's scrolls. Next, please. We have a woman bringing what I think is a centerpiece that's going to go on the banquet table. And you see little dots of red and blue. And actually, I think these are figures made out of dough. And they're all symbols for celebrating the new year. Big uh, golden ewer filled with wine. So it's a good time to drink wine. Next, please. We have in the lower corner of the painting, we have a woman bringing a big colored ball. There are lots of festivities and games for New Year's. And we also have a woman, the close up there of a lacquer food box. So bringing food, it's a very common present for New Year's. Next, please. And focusing in on the table, we see golden wine goblets, and we see in the center of the table, there is a tortoise shell box. This is hexagonal. Often for the New Year's time, you have hexagonal or octagonal trays or boxes that are called trays of togetherness, bringing the family together. 
And here it's filled with little nuts and seeds. And seeds, again, the word for seed is a homophone for the word for sun, as in male air. So one of the wishes that you have during New Year's is for family continuation. So fertility is a big theme in New Year's, and it can be represented through food. You also see a little incense burner on the table. So they're going to be burning incense in order to honor the Junkwe portrait they put up, but more importantly, to honor the ancestors who they're inviting to this festival. Now, I want to know what Lydia will put in that box. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Uh, speaking of, a little bowl of snacks and seeds. Um, I prepared this for this year um, at my apartment. Um, so for my close friends who is actually coming to visit, you know, there are uh, sunflower seeds, there are pistachio and, you know, the classic Chinese dates. And I have some preserved plum as well. Um, so like Jen had mentioned, the modern celebration of Lunar New Year includes much of the similar activities reflected in the painting. Um, for example, from putting up some window display, which I have put them in frames um, that's decorated in my background, um, to like lighting up firecrackers, and of course, family gatherings. It is an essential part uh, because Chinese New Year is the most important and biggest holiday in our culture, and families would get together from afar. So looking at um, this slide here, we have uh, what is considered the modern decor, um, which is deriving away from putting up things on the window. Uh, we see a beautiful modern wreath decor, which is made with Chinese flower and leaves, which um, I only happened to see this year. Um, I think it's very innovative and a creative artwork. And looking at what we have on the right, uh, we see the God of the Fortune figuring. Uh, it's Ear of the Ox and with some red envelopes underneath. What we, I also have here <laughs> uh, is a bunch of red envelopes. Um, I realize I'm actually at the age of giving out envelopes instead of receiving. Uh, so the children of the family would normally receive family revel, uh, red envelopes with money inside. And the older generations uh, are investing in the next generation for their college found or hobbies. And I'd like to share a little story of what I remembered. Um, the time I was spending Luna New Year in my grandma's village. Uh, on the actual Luna New Year day, small kids uh, would visit every house in the village to wish everyone a happy new year. And in return, we receive um, small gifts and snacks. Uh, the whole day, we go in and out of every house, play firecrackers on the way, and the doors are kept open the whole day with people going in and out. So this year, unfortunately, uh, I don't get the chance to spend the holiday with my grandma who is in China right now. Um, that's her in the background. So now uh, we will have our first Q&A session. So if you, had, you do have any question for one of our panelists and you haven't um, submit in the Q&A window, please feel free to do so now. And to start with, so Lydia, for, thank you for sharing like uh, your favorite dish, the dumpling for Lunar New Year. And we do have a question about the dumpling. So are uh, the dumpling in the shed of money mostly eaten only during the Lunar New Year celebration? Well, I would say it's one of the uh, stable and classics. Um, it's a dim sum that, that we like to have um, either for during the day when the chef of the family is too busy preparing the meal, but also it's, um, you know, during dinner as well. So it's one of the classic dish to have um, during a banquet meal. Mm -hmm. And um, also, I think this question, uh, maybe for both you and Jen. So we, fed, we have a question about like, uh, uh, during the new year, do men also involved in food preparation and like the during the new year decoration? 
So maybe uh, nowadays and also maybe in the past, if you have anything to share about this. I guess, uh, Jen, would you like to start? Sure. I think traditionally in the decoration of the house, the men could definitely be involved. Uh, certainly pasting the door guardian uh, prints on the doors and such uh, could be men. Uh, the food preparation traditionally uh, in the family goes to the woman. But if we're thinking about the imperial court, we're thinking about imperial chefs, they're men. So it's quite mixed too by the family situation, the social status and such. But men also, if you're wondering in this painting, you see the women and the children and you don't see the men. It's because this is an imperial painting. And typically the women and children would have their celebration on New Year's Eve and they would wait for New Year's Day to be invited by the emperor to a family banquet. So at that level of society, there was more of a gender segregation. And speaking of modern, I actually remember um, my dad used to only cook during Luna New Year. Um, well, because he's a chef, he cooks all the other times for other people. And Luna New Year, it's such a celebration of family gathering. Um, it's his time to shine in front of the whole family. Yeah. So he uh, would actually help out in the kitchen and be the chef of the night. Uh, and also, you know, when it comes to deep cleaning of the house, which is another tradition that we do in preparation of Luna New Year, um, he would actually help out um, getting the tall corners that the, uh, normally my mom or grandma wouldn't be able to reach. So we have um, another uh, fascinating question. So. Uh, could you tell us, maybe for both of you, if you know anything about this, so could you both tell uh, us a little bit more about like, um, uh, what's the regional difference of um, Nunu New, Chinese Nunu New Year meal and celebration in China? I guess it's probably different from region to region and even from family to family. So if you have anything to share. Yeah, so foods, um, I would say Chinese food in China or even outside of China, it definitely changes and moves. Um, for example, I know there is a part in China that's in the south, it's called the Canton province, which is, um, you know, it's like uh, the Texas and Florida, um, if we compare geography. Um, it's constantly in the 20s, um, or 20 Celsius, even in the winter time. So I know that a classic dish for them to have during Luna New Year would be a form of raw fish. Uh, that's something I learned uh, recently. And then talking about the region all the way, you know, towards the north, you know, you were eating like maybe a whole lamb. Um, so in, from, in terms of dumplings, the feeling could change too. Uh, in um, they can easily make a pork dumpling or lamb dumpling, beef dumpling. It's all very different. And typically you have even more uh, wheat and millet in the north than you do in the south. One of the dishes is eating longevity noodles. You know, we'll talk about the fact that one of the uh, multiple celebrations of New Year's is People's Day, which is everybody's birthday. Everybody turns a year older at New Year in the traditional um, context, but longevity noodles with all kinds of preparations are even better in the North than the South. <laughs> or, you know, you might switch to rice noodles in the South. They're different, they're different uh, dishes, definitely. And um, uh, we have another interesting interesting question. Um, so we talk so much about the foods like have um, that brings good luck and good fortune, like uh, those uh, sim symbolic dish for New New Year. So um, we have a question about, is there any food item uh, one show uh, above it? So it won't bring bad luck for the coming year. Any? 
it's <laughs> difficult just to say one, you know, since we are going to talk about food in the next section, maybe that's the time that we can show an array of things I have in front of me. Mm -hmm. But you certainly, you know, you avoid things like sharp objects. Um, there, there are lots of customs, but off the top of my head, I can't think of a single food, but there certainly must be some. Mm -hmm. And on New Year's Day, you don't sweep. You sweep the bad luck out on New Year's Eve, but mm -hmm. you've got to be done sweeping on New Year's Eve because you wouldn't want to sweep out the luck on New Year's Day. So another question we have is that, um, so Jen, you shared about like your favorite, uh, favorite New Year dish, it's fish. And so we have a question just um, in a region where there's no fish avail available. Um, do people eat something else as substitutes? Do you know anything about this? Well, one of the things you can do is eat salted fish. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of ways of curing and preserving things like fish so that they can be moved around uh, large distances. But in some places too, where they don't have um, good fish, they might have better crabs, they'll eat crabs because the word for crab is a homophone for harmony. <laughs> so it tastes good and it works. So there are substitutions, but there are a lot of preserved foods too. And so let's um, uh, uh, have, uh, this question is not about foods. But I think it's an interesting question. So we know like in, uh, in Japanese culture or like in other culture, there are flowers uh, associated with like New Year. So uh, do you know anything in Chinese culture, like the, any particular kind of flower that's associated with New Year? New Year? Lydia, do you want to answer or, you know, it also depends on region. It does. But yeah, I would say um, at least the region I'm from, um, it's actually known for um, Meihua, uh, <laughs> which is the flower that grows and blooms in the winter time. you know. It's a blossoming plum. That's, mm -hmm. that's what it is. Flowering right. Plum. Yeah, and that's, so that's something that we typically, you know, um, display at home for the fragrance and for um, decor as well. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And then they also have fruits. So you can use the finger citron. It kind of looks like a hand and it's very fragrant and it's very common at New Year's for all kinds of auspicious wishes. Mm -hmm. And red pomegranates for their red color and the seeds for fertility. So you mix uh, flowers and, and fruits and evergreen uh, branches for the idea of renewal and greenness. Mm -hmm. So another question, it's more like generally about New Year New Year. So uh, there, we, we know like the uh, Chinese New Year New Year is like a celebration of like a more than two weeks. So are there um, any different custom or tradition associated with different days? I would say, you know, uh, if we look at all the preparations leading up to Luna New Year, there's a day for cleaning, there's a day for like, um, you know, preparing for the food, there's a day for um, praying to the ancestors. Um, it's actually, you know, a lot longer than two weeks. <laughs> and um, uh, during the actual Luna New Year, every day you're supposed to visit um, a, a certain part of extended family. You know, you start with your mom's side and you move on to visiting your dad's side and then all their really uh, related cousins, uh, their aunts and uncles. I just remember it was going from houses to houses the whole, the whole duration. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, days, well, as I said, there's People's Day, which honors everybody's birthday, so longevity noodles for that. But there also used to be a tradition of making a spring ox, because uh, traditionally China is an agrarian civilization. And so there was a day for honoring the ox and celebrating. Mm -hmm. There's a day to celebrate the mouse's wedding. Yes, it's a wonderful fable and it ultimately is about protecting your harvest because in the end, your mouse gets married, but also gets eaten by a cat. Uh, so there, there are special days, um, definitely. Yeah. 
that's really fascinating. So now maybe uh, let's uh, explore another artwork from our collection with Jen. So digital floor back to you, Jen. We're going to look at a wonderful food box. Um, and here it is. It's mid 18th century, uh, made for the Imperial Palace, made by the order of the Qianlong Emperor. And it's for holding food. Food was one of the most important uh, gifts that you could also give at the new year. And we know from records in the dynasty, the Qing dynasty, when this was made, that the emperor used to have, the emperor had his own residence with uh, his own kitchen. The empress had her residence with her own kitchen. They're in the same large compound. But the emperor would order food gifts and they would be sent over to the empress's residence in a box like this. And she might reciprocate with another a uh, food gift back. But I want to explore the imagery of this fabulous box. Uh, it is red lacquer. So lacquer is a lacquer tree sap and it's a very slow, laborious process to build up the lacquer and to make this design that's then carved. And here in the center, you have the character spring. So spring festival, we hear that's a common name for the holiday. It has to do with the idea of renewal, longevity, and springtime all coming together. Now, if we can go to the next detail, please. In the close-up, you're going to see there's a little roundel on the top of the spring character and a funny little guy with a very tall forehead sitting there. That is the god of longevity. And so again, this idea that New Year's is a time to celebrate longevity as well as fertility and family continuation. And then next to the uh, God of longevity, there's a deer. And deer through various homophones can sound like having an official position and um, the emolument, the salary that comes with it, wealth. And deer can also be a symbol of longevity. So we're packing good wishes into every aspect of this box. And you see on the sides two auspicious dragons, and they're surrounded by clouds, and dragons cavort in the clouds. And these two dragons um, are treated slightly differently. Um, so they're just, it's as an artwork, it's really spectacular. Next, please. Beneath the character that says spring, you have this fabulous treasure bowl. I mean, it's equivalent to the Western cornucopia. This is filled with symbols that bring good luck. And there is an idea that by surrounding yourself with auspicious things, you can actually in some way, at some level, influence those auspicious things to happen, to occur. So in the center of this dish, we have a knotted form, which is called the knot of longevity. Uh, we have a branch of coral, which is an exotic substance that can also be associated with longevity. We have coins, and on the circular coins, this box is so detailed in quality. There are even Chinese characters on the coins that say, will there be great peace under heaven? So this is just filled with good wishes. And you see radiating uh, from the dish, are alternating bands of red and green lacquer, sort of a rainbow of the light, the glow that comes from the wealth that's in this dish. And this is all carefully carved um, through multiple, multiple layers of lacquer. And then these very high relief clouds are actually made separately out of lacquer and little molds shaped like the clouds. And then those are picked up and they're adhered to the other lacquer surface using wet lacquer. So I can't explain the whole process in detail, but I want to give you some sense of awe for the ingenuity and the command of the craft to make a box like this. Next, please. So I want to bring you back to the box and invite Lydia to tell us what she would put in the box. I might put dumplings or, or some kind of steamed bun. In fact, this box is sometimes called the steamed bun shape. But what are you going to put in, Lydia? I believe we have something on the next slide, which will show a classic uh, traditional banquet. And we see in the top corner right there, um, it has a lacquer box. 
which I see from the photo, it's actually um, an array of cold dishes, which is a classic starter for a banquet meal. Um, so we see some vinegary, typically we use um, vinegary jellyfish, uh, sesame tofu skin, some pickled radish, um, and salted duck. Uh, the, main, the main dishes ha also have certain classics across China. Uh, for example, a whole fish, which we can see in the center, um, also, you know, just signifies the surplus uh, and something like the lion's head, um, which are all the classics. And moving on to the next day, next page. Um, so during Lunar New Year, um, the dinner is normally on the eve of Lunar New Year and days of preparations will take place by chef of the household. Um, and normally my family's signature dish is cured uh, meat platter. Um, this year to honor that, my mom actually made some homemade sausage, um, which normally my grandma would make uh, with like marinated in five spice with ginger, chili, um, Chinese baijiu and Sichuan peppercorn. Um, and during the day, since the chef of the household would be so busy doing all the dinner, um, she would prepare some dumplings uh, and snacks, dim sum for us to have during the day. Um, something like uh, spring roll, which we have right here. And of course, some dumplings. Uh, one of my favorite dim sum is actually called Tang Yuan. Um, it's a sweet, sticky rice cake. Um, it's actually, I have some boils also right here. Um, the name for rice cake, which is Nian Gao in Chinese, um, it signifies for a year better and a year higher. So other things like, um, we can move on to the next date. Next page. Yep, uh, it looks like this year um, within the family of three, which is me, my mom and dad, we're going to have our dinner tomorrow night. It will be more uh, like a hot pot or Buddha style stew, uh, which we see on the left. And not to mention, you know, the classic um, platter of cured meat, which is on the right. Next, please. And uh, those are the Northern style dumplings. Uh, you can also make it into a different color dough with fresh veggie juice. Alrighty, so the last page is actually uh, what I would call a modern fist. Um, since nowadays, um, you know, even and especially because of COVID, um, we tend to gather with our most immediate um, family, sometimes, uh, you know, with a couple, sometimes three. And this will be a great variety of things. It has my favorite dish, the dumpling. It has Jen's favorite, the roasted whole fish. Um, it has a longevity noodle, which is on the bottom. It has a, a wonderful rice cake, tangerine trifle dessert, uh, which, you know, anything um, in the citrus family, like tangerines, kumquat, and oranges are very uh, popular desserts to have during the holidays, during the Lunar New Year holidays. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you, uh, thank you, Jen and Lydia for your enlightening presentation. So now we will uh, move to our um, another Q and A session that we do have like many questions coming from the in the Q and A window. So uh, to start with, so Jen, so you show us like a really beautiful decor box, and uh, could you tell us uh, a little bit more about like the 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 box? It's it's only used during the New Year. It's it's also given as a gift, or it's it's also used in other special occasions. Very good question. We think that this particular pattern of box, well, this much we know, this pattern was developed in the mid uh, 1600s, under, uh, mid 1500s under an emperor who was craving longevity, uh, really craving immortality. So he came up with lots of imagery that stressed this idea of immortality. 
And then several hundred years later, the Qianlong Emperor fell in love with that pattern. So he commissioned lots of boxes made out of lacquer, made out of cloisonne, luxury materials. And we think they were used as food presentation boxes at the Lunar New Year primarily, but possibly also for other birthdays. Because the idea of spring is also an idea almost of eternal youth. And, and uh, so it can be also for birthdays. There was a tradition of always packaging your food in a beautiful box or container. Then you send it over to someone as a gift. They get to enjoy the food, but they're going to have to return the box. And so they will fill it with food from their own kitchen, and then they'll send it back. So it's a little bit like wrapping paper to keep, and you send it back. Mm -hmm. Yes. So in media, so we, um, we know there are many dishes like a fish, fish or meat, and uh, uh, we are also curious about, like, is there any common veg vegetarian dish to include for, like, a, a Chinese Lunar New Year banquet? Yeah, I will say we are a culture also eat a lot of veg, um, specifically tofu. So when um, a lot of vegetarian Chinese dish, we incorporate with tofu, bean curds, or eggplants. Um, all of those can make into delicious veggie dish. Mm -hmm. So uh, since this year is going to the year of ox, so uh, if Jen, you can tell us like, uh, uh, does ox represent anything in Chinese culture? Oh, definitely. Um, ox, uh, remember that China was traditionally agrarian. So oxen and also water buffaloes are main animals for ensuring your farming, your harvest, um, your planting, your harvesting. So they're very important animals, but they have a very close relationship with the farmers. So they're known as being very hardworking, very diligent, um, trustworthy, faithful. And so that's the characteristic of, of a person born in the year of the ox. But again, there, there are slight differences whether you're born in a year of a metal ox or a wood ox relating to other cosmological features. And here we're coming into the metal ox year. And metal with its reflective strong um, characteristics generally is an auspicious sign. So the metal ox is a very good year. We, we should be having um, lots of good things happening, but according to one of the fortune tellers in Hong Kong that I've been reading, we're supposed to proceed a bit cautiously, be steadfast like the ox, but move slowly. And maybe that'll get us through COVID. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, Jen. So uh, we have another question about, so people already uh, uh, are getting excited about the, this kind of banquets like you may be able to enjoy in the area. So just, do you guys have any recommendation like for uh, like a dish like this where you can get a nice Duna New Year style dish from the, the area? Well, I can say, you know, where I am, um, we have several restaurants in the DMV area. Um, and uh, the previous slide, actually, if we can move up one slide. So um, the Modern Fist, it's what we offer at uh, Baltimore. Um, you get a Lona New York package with every single item from this slide. And you can enjoy a small um, Lona New York Fist at home uh, for our other restaurants. You know, you can order things like lobster noodles, which is in the form of longevity noodle. And you can order something like lion's head, the shrimp dumplings, which are all the classic staples that we have. And here, while we have this slide, um, we were talking about tangerines and oranges. Their gold color relates to money. <laughs> and also their name, you can make a kind of pun 
for um, good wishes. So everything here is encoded with meaning and you might just have to cook some of it yourself. That's what I'm gonna to try to do this year. Mm -hmm. But also notice in this slide, you see six dishes together around a center dish. And if you remember the tortoise shell box in the Ming painting, there were six compartments around a center. So it's, it's certain traditions almost um, subconsciously are being followed. Mm -hmm. So I'm like auspicious, like a sign of Mimi. So Jen, uh, um, at the very beginning of your presentation, you show us like the woodblock prints of the door guardian. And uh, could you tell us uh, a little me more about the figure in the picture? Are they based on the real character? Well, there are many different stories about the door guardians, but one of the uh, frequent stories is that there was an eighth century emperor who was uh, being besieged by ghosts and such. And two of his officials actually said they would guard the palace. And so they stood there all night long and the emperor didn't have any ghosts. And so they had to stand there the next night and he didn't have any ghosts. But when they weren't there, he had ghosts. So being a kind emperor, he decided to have a portrait painter paint their portraits in full armor and use the portraits as substitutes. Now, we know this is just a made up apocryphal story because a very similar story is used about that disheveled figure called Zhong Kui, the demon queller. But this is, this is so they're, they're not based on, on real figures. Um, and there are more than one door guardian. So this particular military Hair is based on that um, Tang Dynasty story. And then their bright red faces, the facial makeup and such might have reminded you of what you see in Peking opera. And in fact, these prints were made around 1900 and a lot of art was absorbing influences from the very, very popular theater world. So they're kind of theatrical um, versions of ancient military figures. Yes, thank you, Jen. And um, let's uh, kind of jump back to the food foods thing. So it's not really about foods, but um, someone just wondering. So is there any alcohol or alcohol tradition associated with Nuna New Year? Is there any particular kind of alcohol you consume on Nuna New Year? Uh, well, the national uh, spirit of um, China is actually called Baijiu. Um, you know, it's um, it's something that it's not easily to get our hands on in the U.S. But yeah, definitely um, you enjoy the feast uh, with liquor. And in that Ming painting, we saw wine cups and wine ewers. Mm -hmm. But also you can make puns in some dialects between the word for wine and the word for a long time as in longevity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And so we we uh, talk like uh, we really focus on like a lot of, like a savory dish, and but we all we are also curious about like um, um, if you can tell um, us more about like what kind of dessert of sweets do you usually enjoy you enjoy like um, during Lunar New Year. That will be fantastic. Yeah, something like, um, you know, tangyuan, which is, um, you know, the filling can be red bean or um, black sesame or even lotus, lotus root puree. Um, other things like we eat a lot of fruits, um, you know, as Jen had mentioned earlier, anything citrus, um, pomegranates, um, you know, Asian pear, um, which is all like very in season for the time, he, for uh, appropriate for the time. Mm. Yeah. And then Lydia, you talked earlier about the New Year's cake, um, the Nian Gao. Yeah. And there also are different ways to make it and flavor it. You can put uh, jujubes and nuts and various seeds in it. And of course, once you've done that, the name for the cake itself is making you think of a 
prosperous, a high year. And if you fill it with nuts and seeds, then you're thinking of having lots of uh, male heirs and family continuity. So there are, again, many games that are played, word games that are played with the flavorings. And personally, I like the Niangao with the, with the dates. Mm -hmm. That's my personal favorite as well. <laughs> yeah. So Lydia, uh, we do have a couple, couple questions. So you show us like um, in one of the uh, banquet, probably the modern banquet mm -hmm. picture, there's a dish called money bowl. So mm -hmm. people are wondering what is this dish? <laughs> yeah, if you can tell us more about. Oh, well, it's actually a name that we came up with. It's in the color goes. It has sesame seeds on the top. Um, typically, the filling would um, normally be like a, a red bean paste or a lotus root puree, but we made it into a savory um, uh, savory dish. Um, it actually has uh, cumin duck in there. So yeah, uh, it's our take on the classic sesame ball, which is a um, you know, something that people enjoy as dessert, but we made it into a savory dim sum. Mm. Yeah. So, Jen, um, um, you talk about like in the picture, there are six dishes around the fish. So, um, we have a question about is there a certain amount of dish that shall be served um, New Year's Eve and New Year's Day? What I've seen is that these so-called tray of togetherness where you have compartments, um, they typically have um, six or eight um, dishes together with a, with a centerpiece. Now over the banquet, I'm not aware of there being a specified total number of dishes. Um, I have from personal friends seeing that there is a desire that everybody wants their banquet to go on forever. So it's a very large number of dishes, but let's see if Lydia has, has um, any number in mind. Well, we like to say the more the merrier. <laughs> uh, uh, I would say um, classic, the 10 out of 10, it's a very wholesome number. Um, so it really depends on the family size. If you're celebrating with like less, maybe around four, five, six people, 10 dishes, it's more than abundant. Uh, when you have a large family of like 15, 20 people, then I would say it's going to be like a whole night of uh, nonstop eating. You just keep getting things sending the way. And the other thing is there is sort of a tradition of not cleaning your plate. Mm -hmm. So you're not, you, you can have a huge number of dishes brought before you because you're not sitting down and eating the whole thing. You're tasting it. And so for the New Year's Eve banquet, the idea is really to make it resplendent. So you're going to want as many foods as you can comfortably afford. And of course, if it's a home chef, um, the amount of time and energy you have will limit the dishes. But please don't look at this huge feast and think everybody's cleaning it up. So there are lots of leftovers. And these the food doesn't go to waste. Um, you also want to have lots of dishes because you're actually going to make offerings of food, wine, flowers, and incense in front of paintings or now photographs of the ancestors. So they, in a sense, are partaking and eating of the meal. It's just they don't physically um, eat, but you have to have food for them as well. And then the family will eat that food. Yeah, I, will, I agree. Spiritually, we're all one part being wholesome. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we have a couple questions about the lion hates me ball. Uh, Lydia, you, you share with us, does this represent anything? Why do we have a lion head for <laughs> the new year? It's actually uh, called shi zi to in Chinese. What it, 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 what it is, it's uh, a giant meatball. Um, you know, I've never got to a question why does it even resemble lion's heads? Because I see the mane on lion, you know, it's not in the shape of a perfect round, right? <laughs> <laughs> so actually, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, the animal lion at all. 
Although, you know, if you serve your lion's head meatball with a little bit of shredded cabbage and such, you suddenly have a round animal head with a mane. And lions themselves are um, auspicious. So lions, you can make a pun with a word for lion that sounds like teacher. Um, you can look at lions as being guardian figures. They were associated with Buddhism when Buddhism came into China and guarding uh, religion. They also are used as symbols uh, in the imperial palace to protect the palace. So it's a food that has that kind of lucky associations that you want to have it at New Year's. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, I think this question is very interesting. So since this year will be the year of ox, so we have a question about will it be traditional or against the rule to eat the animal associated with the year? So for instance, this is the year of us. Maybe you should not eat uh, the beef or like, <laughs> yeah, anything to share about it? I don't think the year actually allows you or prohibits you from doing anything. Uh, but, you know, generally um, the people that are born in the year of ox, you know, they're shown as being very resilient, hardworking and uh, honest. This is what's uh, the meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we, if we can go back to the slide of the deco bus, this is the question for Jen. So uh, you show us like um, uh, uh, several symbols on the deco box. And if you could tell us more about like other symbols like um, this box, that will be, yeah, great. Well, let's start by looking at the entire box. What you see in the center is the character for spring. And on top of the character is the longevity, uh, god of longevity in the roundel. It's the treasure bowl below. And we can look at the treasure bowl again to point out some of the treasures. And then you have the two dragons uh, and they're among clouds. Now, when you look at the treasure bowl, or okay, here, let's stop for the dragons for a minute. What I find really fascinating about these two dragons, look carefully, the one on the left and the one on the right are slightly different. The one on the left is what you see as a classic Chinese dragon image. It has scales, sort of like fish scales or over the body, and it has these long whiskers coming out of the nostrils. It has the horns. It has a spiky tail. It's a very classic looking dragon. The one on the left side is not so classic looking because look, its body doesn't have scales. And look at the tip of its tail. It's almost like fur. So there is not yet a clear answer that I found in written text describing this, but it's something I've seen before. And it's often that you have one dragon that looks a little bit like a tiger, because in Chinese cosmology, you have a tiger on the uh, west and you have a dragon on the east. So this might be adding a sort of cosmological dimension by bringing in east and west. There's also a possibility maybe that it's a special kind of younger dragon. So this is something I'm gonna do more research on, but it's very clear that the artist was very conscious in how to model and make sure there are two styles of dragon here. Now we can go to the next slide, please. In the treasure bowl on the far sides, both left and right, you see uh, shapes that actually represent ancient money. Uh, sorry, I can't use my cursor because it just doesn't uh, work. But you have ancient money in that form. Yes, thank you. Um, so that's representing silver or gold uh, in very large hunks as currency. Then if you go just a little bit um, to, yes, that is a coin. So it has that pierced center. Coins could be strung on a piece of string. Um, 
And that's how you could count them out and tie them together. And on that circle, it does say uh, great peace under heaven. So that's a New Year's wish rather than just saying it's it's currency. Then if you go to the up above, you see something that's pointing out. Um, yes, and right above that, right above that, yes, right there, that's a rhinoceros horn. And rhinoceros horns were valued. I mean, people at that point had no concept of extinction, so let's not think that way. But rhino horns were valued as being um, luxurious, exotic commodity. They could be carved into beautiful vessels. And they were also said to make vessels that if you put poison in a rhino horn vessel, uh, the vessel would change color. So it was um, good uh, to have those. So you have them, again, that's wealth, prosperity, longevity, a branch of coral. So I, I know we're coming to the conclusion, but everything in this um, tray is just filled with good meanings. And in the center, the very dead center, you have a knot of longevity at the top. Below that, you have a jewel that has flames around it. So it's a flaming jewel of wisdom. Uh, and so you also have tucked into the uh, dish, you have rolled up scrolls. Those could be scrolls that are images, but they could be scrolls more likely with spring couplets and good wishes. So that's pretty much what you have in your bowl. Thank you, Jen. So it's almost six, uh, it's almost seven o'clock. So um, I would like to wrap our, our conversation tonight. So thank you again for joining us tonight. And I hope uh, this was enlightening and enjoyable to all of you. And please also take a few moments to complete a online survey um, to let us know what, um, what you think about the program tonight. And the, the link, the survey link will be available in the chat. And thank you again, Jen and then and Lydia for sharing your knowledge, insights, and story. And I also want to thank our live stream production team, Andy Finch, Chris Murray, Kara Nolan, and Hutomo Wikasono. So um, we look forward to see you again soon in uh, another online program. And Happy New Year. Happy Year of the Ox. Happy Year of the Ox. And it was great fun doing this. And thank you, everyone at the Freer Sackler. And thank you, Lydia, for coming. Thank you.